Hey, CNFers. Promotional support is provided by Hippocampus Magazine. Its 2018 Remember in November contest for creative nonfiction is open for submissions until July 15th. This annual contest has a grand prize of $1,000 and publication for all finalists. That's awesome. Visit hippocampusmagazine.com for details. Hippocampus Magazine, memorable creative nonfiction. Hey, we're back in the saddle again. I took a week off from producing a show, much to the chagrin of the wife, who thought it was a bad move to miss a week, but I had two hard deadlines, a long feature and a long column, and our dog is in rough shape these days, so it's incredibly hard to focus. On top of that, I, I, I got some feedback, great feedback on this book I've been writing since 2009, and it's it's the kind of feedback that is incredibly valuable, smart, and incisive, but it's made me realize just how shitty I am at this. I'm paying a significant amount of our, our GDP to uh, become a better writer and editor myself throughout this whole process, but it's a, it's a continuing ed thing as much as trying to get my stupid book published. Okay, so I'm probably less shitty than I was 10 years ago, but I'm still, like, wicked shitty. 10 years from now, I'll be less shitty than I am today, and all the people I've disappointed along the way will likely be dead, so there's that. So, what is the show? It's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast. You know, that's the show where I speak to artists about telling true stories. Today's guest for episode 103 is Dennis Overby. At Overby on Twitter. It's O V E R B Y E. He's a science writer for the New York Times. He's also a Pulitzer Prize finalist and author of two books Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos, The Story of the Scientific Quest for the Secrets of the Universe, and Einstein in Love, a Scientific Romance. That's fun. I'd love it if you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and share episodes across your social streams with people you think you might get some value from the interview. You are the social network. I algorithm you. That's it, friends. Here's yeah, Dennis Overby, episode stuff, 103. But, uh, the day that we were actually supposed to speak several weeks ago was the day that Stephen Hawking passed, and uh, I suspect that that is about as hectic a day as uh, as you get on the cosmic beat, so what was that day like? As the news hit you, and then you had to craft, you know, these very long obituaries, and uh, and uh, and also a really a really fine essay about what Stephen Ta- Hawking taught us about life. Right. Um, well, it was. Of course, I found out at midnight, and it had been a bad day, and I didn't sleep that night. Now, luckily. And it's no secret that we prepare advance obituaries of important of, uh, of important people. So I'd actually written Hawking's obituary about three or four times before. So that was pretty much ready to go. The, and, but I knew that, in fact, by the time I got in the next morning, it had already been posted online. But I did have to write have to write that essay, which I had sort of thought about. I mean, I, I'd been thinking about this years and then I thought well this is never going to happen um, and then it did so it was a terrible blow I'm, I'm still trying to come to grips with it because he's a he's, I spent a lot of my career writing about Hawking I started out writing about Hawking 40 years ago right I followed him really through the decades and seen this become such a phenomenon that, you know, it's still hard for me to believe that's hard for me he's gone yeah what was what was your first interactions with him in your first chance meetings back in the 70s um well i saw him rolling through the the ballroom of the copley plaza in boston at a meeting and i thought oh this is just one of the most dramatic things i've ever seen and he was there to give a talk about his his recent discovery that black holes would explode and and what that meant for the universe, and it was you know, it was very deep and very moving. I thought, oh wow, this is like. In some ways, I felt like I'd always known him, but I, of course, I didn't. Right. 
and I, you know, I got to know him a little bit, and then I, I went to England later on and spent some time with him. Yeah, I suspect that that was all that meeting him and then being uh, lucky and blessed enough to be able to follow follow him and have him be a key figure of your first book. That it must have been like what people experienced in the 20s and 30s when they brushed shoulders with Einstein, you know, someone who was really on the cusp of innovation and just expanding what we knew and really changing the way we understand or think about thing, uh, think about the universe. So did, did you, in those moments, they like, realize that you were experiencing something that might only come around every 50 to a hundred years? You know, I think as a writer, well, you recognize when an extraordinary story, an extraordinary character walks into your life and uh, you want to make the most of it. So I've been lucky enough to have that happen a few times, and Hawking, Hawking was, was one of them. You have, to be in the, you have to be in the right place at the right time. So uh, getting getting back to maybe a little bit of your origin, Dennis, um, what was your early, early start and your early love for covering um, science writing and then sp- specifically getting put on to say uh you know getting on the, the the coolest beat of all time which is just covering the universe got a job as the assistant type center at sky and telescope magazine for six dollars an hour after writing a letter to every publisher in the boston yellow pages uh, pleading for a job who might have been those those writers, say, in the, the sci-fi genre that were sufficiently exciting to you, and then you decided to then sort of maybe merge that exciting language with the with the, the nonfiction elements of covering the the cosmic beat. So who who were some of those early influences for you? In terms of science fiction, you know, it's the kind of the trinity of Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Feynman, and Isaac Asimov. I think probably Clark, especially because I actually met him. And one of my uh, most valued possessions is uh, framed in my office, actually, is a letter he wrote about Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos after he read it. So, um, Hmm. what is it? Can you recall off the top of your head uh, what that letter says? Well, so. Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos is sort of a kind of a history of recent cosmology and the people who kind of first happened on the idea of the Big Bang and the expanding universe and the Palomar Telescope and Clark knew all these guys. So he read the book and he said, you know, reminded him of his old days visiting Palomar and and, uh, the people he met. He thought I captured them well. We have some technical disagreements, but he had some wild ideas. But it was fun, except he didn't like the title. Uh huh. <laughs> Not the title. He thought the title was off putting. Huh. With the, the the positive things that he said about it, was that as any as any writer can attest to having having someone validate a particular artistic endeavor can put a lot of fuel in the tank. So like getting that letter from someone that you revered from, from uh, your early reading, like what did that do to you as a, as a writer? Did it, did it just kind of like, you know, fill, fill your blood with a lot more, uh, a lot more energy or, uh, and how long did that last? Well, like I said, you know, I framed it and it's hanging on the wall in my study along with, you know, award plaques and things like that. Cause it's, another kind of award as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it, it at that point had any effect on my, um, you know, made me feel good, but didn't really have any effect on my career aspirations or anything like that. So, uh, so when you were in uh ninth grade, you know, I, I read from your, from your bio, you got, you got kicked off the, the newspaper and uh, it took you. All right. I've right. forgotten what parts of the story you <laughs> yeah, I was in a, a after school without permission in a room in which an eraser was thrown. Just one? 
just one <laughs> racer. I don't know. I mean, the other thing was that I had, which I kind of forgot and I kind of remembered that I had also written a letter pretty much accusing the principal of lying to that student body. He didn't like that either. And that actually, that editorial never ran. <laughs> So that was the end of my journalism career for 20 years, and I and, and I got more interested in science. I mean, I've already been reading lots of science fiction anyway. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, a degree in physics from MIT, that'll, that'll get you in the door in terms of uh, very high-level, high-concept science. So how did that uh, inform the reporting that you would later do after that? Well, it... it, it didn't actually, and what, you know, I would show you my MIT transcript, which is like, <laughs> embarrass, embarrasses my daughter when I discuss it because it was pretty bad. What it did give me with sort of background in fundamentals and the kind of language and, you know, I can, I can melt into the crowd. Yeah, it allows you to to at least ask a question that doesn't seem totally inane, and then you can get the real like dirty information, good dirty muddy information from the real the the real experts. But like that kind of gets you in the door, doesn't it? You know, I, I'm familiar with the landscape, so I'm 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 comfortable around scientists, and they just regard me as part of their furniture. You know? <laughs> At least before I joined the Times. Now with the Times, it's different because there's a there's a light shining on you, even if everything's all off the record. They still don't want to say certain things because they're just so they're, they're so terrified of of the Times. You know? Huh? Like so I can say things in books or magazine articles, and but I but I can't get away with saying in the New York Times because it's such it's uh, so prominent. And then I realized the other thing I've learned is that a lot of the people that I write about, I've known for a long time, and I met them when they were young, they're starting their careers, they're postdocs or something. They're all, they're all senior professors and presidents of professional societies and Nobel Prize winners, and they have, their, their words carry more weight than, than they used to. Mm. And what was so that's it's great in a sense that when you were coming up covering covering cosmology and in, in the universe that that so many of these people were kind of almost um you know paralleled you in age so you guys were kind of just kind of grow, growing and developing in your careers together it wasn't like you were a you know maybe a 25 year old cub reporter covering a 60 year old you know tenured tenured professor, president of whatever society. So it, it must be, that must have been kind of, kind of neat to see almost the entire arc of a, of a career play out before you, I imagine. Yes, although in my mind, I'm still a 25-year-old cub reporter. <laughs> right, right. And it, that's got to be, that's got to be key to sort of maintain that, that hunger and, and hustle of a, of a young reporter, but imbued with all the experience you've had over the last 40 years. I guess you could put it that way. I don't, um, I don't, feel, I don't feel it that way. <laughs> so how, how, in terms of getting access to uh, the people that you want to write about, and it is, it, it appears to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, like a fairly cloistered and very tight knit and almost very small and provincial, um, you know, people who are doing this kind of research. So how have you been able to engender trust and get access to these people so you can write about it as eloquently as you do? So some of it is just because I've known people a long time. And I, when I started out, I had this credential of working for this guy in telescope, which was like regarded as a serious, respectable outlet, <clears throat> as opposed to the New York Times, and so people let me in and they talk to me and they just keep talking to me. And now the New York Times, so I, you know, it's, maybe it's me or maybe it's the New York <clears throat> Times. Uh, but, I, you know, I always get my my calls returned. But I don't know if it's because it's me, Dennis Overby, or it's the New York Times. Uh, maybe it's a combination of both. 
the access kind of comes with it. Yeah, and and what strikes you? Like, what is the most exciting part of what you cover? Like, what what are what fascinates you the most? And you know, what are what are some of those things that you're tapped into that you know just that really excite you? And when you get the chance to write about it, it really you know that kind of spark ignites. I mean, what interests me really are are sort of questions that don't have answers. So, yeah, which seems to be much of the. Uh, much of cosmology it's in the yeah. more each each answer five. seems to spark five or a dozen more questions so i guess i mean the fact that we're really ignorant of everything important about the universe and ourselves is, is fascinating and, and you know we should uh, bask in it and, because it makes us humble and it makes us it makes us curious and it, and it drives us ahead yeah, and what, when I was you know reading the yeah you know, the the Kilonova story you wrote, and then prior to that, you know other people who were, and I'm sure you you were covering it too with the the gravitational wave of those two black holes colliding, um, and that little blip they hear at the LIGO stations, and I wonder in your in your experience of speaking with these scientists and researchers, you know, it it, it really just happened to be. The, lucky that they had the technology and the equipment to catch these chirps at the right time. And have, <clears throat> have any of them expressed any degree of regret might be the wrong word, but it, like maybe do they feel anxious about what they might be missing because they don't have the technology right now to register what data might be out there going unregistered. Does that make any sense? Or do they yeah, just not think about it? Too much time worrying about signals they didn't see. They're busy getting ready to, you know, they're improving the LIGO antennas right now so that they can see deeper and they can see more. So, I mean, it's a, it's a field that's driven by optimism and not regret. I think, um, I mean, luck, luck had nothing to do with it. It took 40 years and a billion dollars. I mean, you know. Yeah. I, I toured one of these facilities last week, and it's it's just mind-bendingly complex. It's so complicated. It's if you ask me to, if you'd set out things that we have to do in order to make this work, I would have just run screaming. <laughs> right, in Washington, they have to compensate for earthquakes in Alaska and the tides out on the Pacific coast, and birds pecking on nitrogen tanks nearby and mice that get into their tunnels and, and the mice poop makes little pinholes in their vacuum tubes. I'm just, I'm um, wow. But they have to put up with it. It's just it's staggering. And so it wasn't luck. It was, it was hard work and determination and, uh, yeah, I guess uh, maybe, maybe what I'm thinking in terms of luck is just the the timing of the windows. Because I think in the Kilanova story, someone said like they I, it was only like, like a couple weeks ago prior to them hearing that signal that the two neutron stars collided, that uh, that they were even able to register it or something. Maybe I'm reading that. Maybe I read that wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I don't discount the the work and the rigor and my God, the um, microscopic attention to detail that these these things to uh register the oh these things that happen you know billions of light years i think uh, the kill over one the, i mean the key to it was that this third detector had come online in italy and mm. so there are now three and the fact that that detector didn't see it or got a very weak signal because it was in a part of the sky where that detector had little sensitivity and that was able they were able to Sort of combine that information from the three detectors and really localize the signal, which which allowed the astronomers to find it, and then they went to town. You know, and it was like four thousand I mean, half the world's astronomers got in on the action. Huh. It was lucky. I mean, so the first collision that they found was, I mean, that was kind of lucky because they were just turning the thing on, and it's new that they actually call advanced LIGO. And they actually hadn't even started their official observing run. This thing happened. And 
it was kind of like if you're going fishing and you pull up by the stream and there's this nice looking fishing hole there and you drop a line in and bam, you get a strike mm. right away. They think, wow, this is a good spot. You might, you might spend the rest of the day that same hole and not get another strike. None of the astronomers or physicists I have talked to were surprised that gravitational waves exist, <clears throat> but it was a surprise that, that what the, the first thing they saw were big black holes colliding because they had expected to see neutron stars colliding. That was those were the specs that they built this thing to, because nobody knew if black holes would collide. It was so, just uh, just that's Einstein had hypothesized hypothesize that but then yeah they they didn't have the data right uh, Einstein's theory uh, suggested that black holes should exist my Einstein didn't like them he didn't like the idea nobody knew if they would actually be colliding mm. but that was exciting because it's just oh I mean there's all this stuff going on out there in the darkness and the void that now you know, we may well, may be able to detect, you know, what kinds of other strange vibrations are out there that we've never even thought about, you know. That's really the excitement about LIGO, you know, less than gravitational waves existed more than like, you know, we're going to tune into this whole other uh, level of, of the universe that, that we haven't had, you know. Mm. Yeah, I heard a... a, a an interesting conversation um, on the Design Matters podcast with Debbie Millman, and she was interviewing, I believe his name is David Spiegel. Um, I think that's his name, but that, does, that name Spurgle? should... I'm sorry? It is Spurgel? Spurgel, that, that's it. And uh, yeah, yeah his, about his career, I'm sure he's someone you're uh, very familiar with in, in the course of your career. And uh, yeah, just what they... Oh, just the you know he was able to take the, the that sort of baby picture of the of the universe from the like I guess three hundred thousand years out from the Big Bang or something, which is you know, very infancy. Yeah, um, so it's listen to that, and then uh, you know the vast you know dark energy and all, all this stuff, and I wonder like how you as a as a reporter of this stuff kind of get your head around it because it is like you were saying earlier, a lot of the stuff is very mind bendy. So how do you ground it and make, try to make sense of it and then convey that to a reader? Well, nobody ever asked me that before. I, I, none of it makes any sense, right? The universe doesn't make much sense. We don't know what dark energy is and we don't know what dark matter is. And I guess it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, I don't have trouble bending my head around it because I spent too much time reading Arthur C. Clarke when I was a kid and uh, mm -hmm. I expect all this stuff to be strange and wondrous. Uh, Is it getting to your, your routine and the way you approach the writing and so forth? I wonder what your what your how you set up your day and what your morning routine might be as you're looking to get into you know, warm up the engine, so to speak, and get to the work you do. And uh, this might be, apply more to when you're doing more long, long form stuff, magazine stuff, or even book work. So if you're in, in that mode, you know, how are you setting up your days? What time are you waking up so you can start, you can hit the day and feel like you are accomplishing something of merit for that day? Well, so I wake up, I wake up at six o'clock and my daughter wakes up a little bit after that. And I see that she gets out the door. I'll go out the door with her and I go to the gym. And sometimes I have my best ideas of the day then on the rowing machine at the gym. I mean, in some ways, every day is the same and every day is different. I mean, if I'm working on some long article, I am kind of obsessed with it and I'm thinking about it all the time. And do you, you say a lot of your best ideas happen at the gym sometimes. So do you have a way of... Uh, a, a system of keeping track of these ideas so you can harvest them later? No, it's just my brain. I mean, it just never, I never stop thinking about it. So. <laughs> if I have a good idea, it usually sticks around. Yeah, like that's your metric of a good idea. Like if I don't forget this idea, then this is something worth worth pursuing. If I forget it, it probably wasn't that good in the first place, For at least for your taste. <laughs> Because it often happens that when you actually then 
sit down to write it down, somehow the sentence just doesn't work, or it never, you realize that you didn't actually, you only conceived half of it or something. And that's sort of frustrating. Sometimes you think you have a good idea and it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere for you. Mm. So, and then when you're working on longer stuff, book, book length narrative, long narratives, and you're beyond that initial honeymoon phase of thinking that the idea is great and, you know, and, and you love it and you're in love with it. But then you get to the ugly middle of the draft. How do you handle the, uh, the ugly grind in that, in that section when you're too far away to turn home and you're very far away from the end? You know, how do you just muscle through that part? So, well, when I was writing my books, I, I felt like I was coming swimming across the Atlantic. And, and so at some point, you've lost sight of land behind you and you haven't seen land ahead of you and you're just sort of going. Um, so I hate it. I mean, I mean, I hate it. And I love the problem at the same time. You know, it's, it's kind of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. But if it's that, I mean, if that's hard, if it's that hard for you, maybe it's going to be that hard for the reader too. And you should be doing something. You should be doing something differently. So, how do you approach your research and then organize your notes? Uh, you're giving me credit for a lot more organization than I have. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you saw my desk, you know, we'd probably be kindred spirits, but. <laughs> I mean, in general, what's over a big project? I mean, you just start out with a list of people and you talk to them and then you talk to the people that they thought you should talk to. And you just keep going. You just keep stepping through all these people. And sooner or later, their stories converge. And then then I feel like I'm actually sort of getting someplace and I have a story to tell. I guess the best example of this lately was the Higgs boson. I did spend six months trying to recreate what actually happened, how they found it. And, you know, there are 3,000, there are two teams of 3,000 people each and can't talk to 6,000 people. Hmm. Story, but you can talk to a lot of people and they all have kind of different views of, of the thing. And, and, but eventually, the, when the stories start echoing each other, then I feel like I kind of honed in on the in on the main narrative. I see. And which story was this? Oh, so this is the. It was called "Chasing the Higgs." It was kind of it was a. It was the entire Science Times section, a few years ago. And it okay. Started the whole search for the Higgs. Goes on, and you know who was involved, and the two teams, and how they, the false leads, and the rumors, and and how it finally came into view, and what we call TikTok. And and, and what do you mean? What do you mean by TikTok? You know, pardon my ignorance. Go back and reconstruct what actually happened behind the scenes of some ah okay work event, like who actually said what to whom, when, and why. You know, what did what did they do? What was, what was going on? Gotcha. That was my TikTok of the discovery of the Higgs bosons. So that was the Pulitzer finalist, and that was just a massive amount of. Of reporting and just you know, report it out. You just keep talking to more people and asking more questions. I had this fantasy that someplace there was some postdoc or graduate student who had first seen a little bump on a graph and that that was the goes on and I could find that person that like first saw. It. And I think I did, but she didn't really want to be. And the teams have this philosophy that. They're all in it together, and, and nobody should get any individual credit because everybody has a different job to do, and it's sort of not fair. The people who like built the detectors and you know spent months down in the hole in CERN, you know, wiring things together, and then, and then some years later, some young kids working in a computer program would like do the final analysis and say, "Oh, there it is." Those people came in at the end and ran the software. It didn't work any more, any more important than the people that, that built the thing years ago. So they, they should all get equal credit. So they, they didn't like having individual people single down. Mm. 
and they won't. And they wouldn't actually say um, like who actually did drafted the final report. I mean, they just you know, signed by everybody, but clearly three thousand people did write the paper. Um, a committee of people write the paper, and a few people who most people should, but they they wouldn't. They were not allowed to be identified. Hmm. So you're fighting that that tendency if you want to know what's happening behind the scenes. They have a philosophical problem with that. When you're working on a long piece of this nature, uh, do you outline your work, these cork boards, flashcards? Like, how do you go about that degree of organization and structure, or do you just fly by the seat of your pants? Well, let's see. I don't know. So it's been different. I can't remember what I did with the Higgs. I mean, it's, I mean, I tend to want to organize things in a narration chronologically. When I did the Einstein book, I actually constructed this file on my computer and every quote, every factoid that I gleaned about Einstein, I put in this big document in chronological order. It was, I mean, it was, it had as many pages as the final book. Hmm. And when you're, when you're, when you're writing the the book, you've got your notes and anything like on a given day, how, how long, what's your endurance like for, for the writing? How long can you go before you need to just stop for the day or just take, take breaks? You know, what does that look like as you're getting into that real generative phase of a, of a project? Well, so that, um, when I'm in that mode, I would start first thing in the morning, then I'd go eat breakfast, then I'd come back and I would, I'd wear out about three or four o'clock in the afternoon and then I'd start thinking about dinner. And do you, me do you measure those days often by, by a word count or just sheer hours in the, in the chair? Certainly not by word count. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe just my own sense of my, am I progressing through this narrative? not i mean if it's a book so you you know you're it's broken up in chapters and you have i mean you have an out you have a chapter outline so it, it's kind of exciting you get to the end of a chapter that's cool you know, why i can go on to the next thing you know but i'll buy a post for yourself any anything yeah in a large you know, a large newspaper piece the same way you divide it up in subdivisions and section done you feel good when you go home you then you face the horrible dilemma of starting over again the next day <laughs> right you don't you never feel good for very long <laughs> right or in some cases feel good at all uh, <laughs> how do you i'm always interested in how writers fight out fight off loneliness and self-doubt so I'd, I, I'd extend that that question to you too especially in the throes of a long project that how do you fend off those feelings of loneliness and self-doubt well they're always there but you have to it's better to produce something than to not produce something mm -hmm. i've kind of gotten to that point about it i do worry i mean every time i write a you know, my editor is actually going to like this, or it's really just not as good as what I was doing before. Somewhere along the way, I developed the attitude that okay, I was, I'm allowed to have one. It's, I'm allowed to have an off day, right? Of course. And so I just, you know, I give myself permission. Probably less lonely now than when I was writing the books, and I was alone. I was living alone. Mm hmm. It was. Uh, now I'm, I'm in a different environment. You know, if you're writing a book, I mean, you're off. You don't know if the world cares about you. If they, the world still remembers you're there. I don't worry about the world not knowing I'm here. And my editor sits literally six feet away from me. Like I can't disappear. And uh, a, a, an interesting conversation I was having with. Um... Uh, baseball coach actually for the for the show he's uh you know he had written this book about um finding clarity about hitting and finding purpose and so when the guys step up to the plate you know they have clear vision of what they 
need to do. And it, and we were talking about strengths and weaknesses. And oftentimes we're told, well, no matter what the discipline, to you have your strengths, but you should try to level up your weaknesses. And he he was arguing that really, you know, especially in the major leagues, it's just like you're good at one thing one or two things actually you should be leaning into your strengths and mitigating weaknesses but not leveling them up so much because otherwise you'll the average of your strengths and weaknesses will then just kind of muddy and you'll end up being sort of jack of all trades master of none so to speak and in this line of work i wonder what you would identify as your strengths and weaknesses and whether you sort of buy into that leaning into the strength versus trying to level up weaknesses. I, I'm kind of interested in how writers and artists process that. I guess if I have strengths, it might be, you know, metaphors. Um, probably my weakness is fact-checking. Mm -hmm. um, I always have to, because I, I just don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So I, 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 should, I could be better at that. Yeah, in terms of, you know, the in in reading your in reading your work, especially that that part that I read before we were officially recording, and I'll just read it again now, just so listeners would uh, would hear it. It said, uh, "This is in your Killanova story," and it's just this wonderful sentence that starts: "All the atoms in your wedding band, and the Pharaoh's treasures, and the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima, and still threaten us all." So the story goes have been formed in cosmic gong shows that reverberated across the heavens. And I think just the way you were able to take this this weird cosmic event that happened, you know, just countless light years away, and then you say, you know, the metals in your wedding band, and then the Pharaoh's treasures, all of a sudden you took something way out there and brought it right down to Earth. And so, like, is that kind of what you're getting at in terms of what you think that you're particularly good at? Yeah, I think that's probably what people think I'm good at. Mixing with cosmic and the personal. One book reviewer said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the only way for people to get their head around this kind of stuff in a lot of ways. It's like you really do have to pull that thread from way the hell out there and get it, get it down into something concrete. And be like, oh, wow. So when those neutron stars slammed into each other, like that made gold. That you know, billions and billions of years later is what was forged, uh, forged on my hand, and is a symbol of eternity, so to speak. Right. Well, that's what you owe people, because I mean, people don't need to know the details of nucleosynthesis or whatever, but they you owe them kind of a sense of what it's like to be in the universe. If you can convey that, you done your job because it's their universe it's not just Einstein's universe it's, this is the only one we have I think maybe not there might be other universes but we can't go there so this is it <laughs> <laughs> well it's like that great Carl Sagan quote um, is that uh, you know, he said something to the effect that you know we're all made of star stuff yeah. and that's yeah, it's kind of that's kind of a cool way to to tie in the cosmos and then bring it back into the heart in a way. Well, it's literally true. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very freaky if you really try to think about it and what that means. And in, in terms of your non nonfiction, you, you, you were referring, uh, you referred to some of the, those, those great iconic science fiction writers when you were coming up um, in terms of maybe some nonfiction what were some maybe like three to five books, if you can even if you can remember them off the top of your head, that are that were very influential for you in terms of um, the work you do and maybe even the style you've adopted over the years. So I should mention Timothy Ferris, who's a friend of mine, and and you know was into this whole business before I was. I when I read. His work, I was very impressed, and I probably saw, yeah, you can do, you can write about this, this stuff poetically. Um, when I wrote Lonely Hearts, I was 
two things that I was trying to follow was one was, was the, uh, the right stuff by Tom Wolf. Mm -hmm. And the other one was the snow leopard by Peter Mathis. And they, those books affected me a lot. Um, what was it about Wolf and Matheson's approach to those books that that struck a chord with you? Well, it's easier to talk about Wolf because I remember the book better than I do the Snow Leopard. But it was, you know, he he's a great writer and he took something you thought you knew about the astronauts and realized you didn't know anything about the astronauts and um, put you into their heads in a way that nobody had done. And I thought that's I'm going to do that with the cosmologists. Yeah, that's uh, it, it goes to the the immense. Uh, patience it takes and then just the willingness to sit back and like you like you said earlier just kind of become a piece of uh, a piece of furniture in the room uh, that allows you to be sort of anthropomorph not yeah, that anthropology Paul be more like an anthropologist and kind of recede into the background and then uh, you can in empathically get into people's heads over over time and just like uh, in Wolf's book, and I suspect uh, with your work, that's kind of what you what you need to get at to really ground some of this really abstract uh, abstract stuff. Well, it's not mis it's not magic. It's a lot of work. I mean, you've got to do a lot of interviewing. You've got to find out. Yeah, you can't intuit what is in people's heads. They'll tell you if you ask them. A lot of times when you do this kind of stuff, you have to you have to ask what seems like really inane and boring questions. But if you don't ask them, then you don't really know what's going on in someone's head or what they were thinking at a certain time. Do you have any experiences of, of getting some pushback from anybody who just kind of rolls their eyes? Be like, man, Dennis, why are you asking me this? <laughs> this is. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've had many moments like that. You just have to endure it. It's your job. That's your your job to be there and ask the questions and you have to ask stupid questions especially you have to ask stupid questions if, in my case because i know a fair amount of background i have to remember that i'm you know i'm there for the reader i'm not there for me and so i have to remember to ask the questions that readers might ask and sometimes you get surprising answers and the other thing is if you ask them to you know you can get them to do a lot of the work for you hmm ask them to explain so when how does this work and you know sometimes they'll give you a nice metaphor or something like that you can you can take and run with it and then they can't complain because it's they, you know it's something they made up themselves right <laughs> and g given how technical a lot of this reporting and jargon can be do you conduct your interviews with a voice recorder to make sure you're getting every little nuance and even the way syllables and everything are pronounced and the words exactly right? Or do you re rely just kind of old school notebook and scribbling? So um, when I did Lonely Hearts, I did do a whole series of interviews with one guy, Alan Sandage, who was like the practically invented cosmology and was famous for not talking to anybody in it. And of hours of conversations with him, uh, which I then had to transcribe, which took days, months actually. I got so sick of it. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't, generally I don't record conversations because then I'd have to listen to them. <clears throat> I, I take notes. So. Yeah, that's, uh, I've, I always like hearing how people, you know, do that because there are some writers like, uh, John McPhee and Lillian Ross, who are adamantly against tape recorders. They think they're intrusive and actually not selective because they take everything in. Um, you know, other people fight the other ways, just like, you know, you can you get everything and then you can be selective later as you transcribe and throw out what you need, but at least you've got it all there. So I'm always interested to see how different reporters and writers process that. So yeah, like, it depends on what you're there for. And, and, um... If it's something like for the newspaper, if you have this conversation, the things that you remember from it are probably the most important things anyway. And you and you've written them down. And you know what? You don't want to get you don't want to get too far down into the weeds. Uh, on other occasions, you 
want a whole complete documentary uh, record of it. Yeah, then somebody wants to deal with it. Actually, anyway, I've been doing more recordings because I, you know, I can now I can send it off and have it transcribed at a pretty reasonable price, and the Times will pay for it. So, oh, so that's but, a, that's excellent. That what service do you use? You know, you have to I just this freelancer who okay who was in Canada and now for some reason she's living in Cyprus, but hmm. uh, she's very fast and very. Accurate. The thing is, then you still get like this multi-page document back that you have to to read and, and, and find the stuff that you want. But at least you'll you know get a very uh, very accurate transcription. Is there a piece of advice? Maybe when you were twenty-five, you wish someone had told you that uh, just would have maybe you know just helped you out. As you were, as you were, say, getting started, or just would have you know, helped sharpen the knife and made things maybe a little bit easier for you and expedited things. Well, I just tell you the same thing I tell everybody: is it's not over till the fat lady sings, and you just got to keep going. You just got to, you have to be persistent and just you know, like keep reporting, keep reporting out, just keep asking questions, never give up. There's no, I don't think there's any kind of magical cure for anything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't think of myself as particularly clever or articulate or charming interviewer or anything. And when I hear other people doing interviews, I feel the same thing. That like, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing magic there. There's just like persistent, constant, careful work. Um, yeah, I like that persistent, uh, you know, careful work. I mean, I think uh, lots of people who are more graceful uh, lyrical writers than me, but so I'm stubborn and I just do it whether I'm talented or not. Hmm. Um, I guess the last thing I'd ask you is, um, you know, what still excites you about about the work you do and where does your optimism lie? God, I don't think anybody ever confused me for an optimist. Um, especially these days. Um, I think it's just because we're, there's so much yet to learn and know and wonder about. We're not running out of mystery. Yeah. All right. And, and Dennis, where can people um, find you online and maybe become more familiar with your work before, before you get out of here? Online? I mean, the New York Times? I mean, mm -hmm. Or like Twitter, you know, your, your social media, you know, where you hang out online. Uh, well, I do have a Twitter account at Overby, and I do have a Facebook page that I don't use much. I post pictures on it from every now and then. But... Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Well, well, Dennis, thanks for carving out an hour of your day and uh, allowing me to get to know you a little more and sort of the person behind the work. So, um, yeah, thanks for the work you do and. Um, I know every time I see a Dennis Overby byline, I'm in for a, a, a nice little ride. So uh, thanks for the work you do, and uh, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Cue outro. Another CNF pod in the can. Can you believe it? Thanks, CNFers. Got any questions or concerns? You can email me, or you can ping me on Twitter at Brendan O'Mara or at CNF pod. I'm also at Brendan O'Mara on Instagram and at CNF Podcast on Facebook. There's no shortage of maddening ways to get in touch with your CNF and buddy. I do all kinds of wacky cross-promotional things. So if you're into that, pick a network and follow me. Say hi. I like that. Most important, if you want my monthly reading list newsletter, head over to brendanomara.com and sign up for it. There's a toolbar across the top, and then sometimes there's a pop-up menu that will come up every now and again. It's once a month. No spam. Can't beat that. Unsubscribe anytime. But don't unsubscribe. I like subscribers. It's fun. If you're feeling especially kind, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes as that helps with visibility and validates this entire operation so we can reach as many people as possible in our little corner of the internet. 
All right, sorry I took last week off. I, that's not going to happen again. No, this week it'll likely happen again, but not next week. I will be back next Friday for another episode. Have a CNF and great week, friends. <laughs>